Okay, hello everyone and welcome. Welcome to our student experience at Syracuse theme session featuring our LGBT Resource Center. My name is Kate Domigal. I'm an admissions counselor here at Syracuse and we are thrilled to have you with us this evening. I'm glad that you're taking part of your day to learn more about what it's like to be a student at Syracuse. Um, this session is part of a series on student experience at Syracuse. So this is actually our second installment. So every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, you can join us for the next several weeks and we'll be going over different topics, um, a range of different items for you to learn about different offices on campus and what it might like to be a student here, um, including study abroad next week, um, our native student program, multicultural affairs and faith and community engagement. So if any of those sessions sound interesting to you, I encourage you after this session to go back on our website and register for those. We would love to have you at any and all um, and keep uh, getting to know you. So um, I want to take a second to introduce our panelists tonight, the director of our LGBT Resource Center, Jorge Castillo. Wave for me, Jorge. Um, and in just a minute, I'm going to turn the program over to him um, so he can uh, get started and tell you all about the LGBT Resource Center. Before I do that, I do want to make a quick um, couple announcements. The first is that we do have a Q&A box um, on your screen tonight in the Zoom session. So if you have any questions that you've come prepared with or um, that, you, that come up for you during the session, I encourage you to use that Q&A box. Um, our colleagues Tammy and Mike are behind the scenes tonight ready to answer your questions or connect you to a resource on our website. Um, and they'll also be indicating some of your questions for us to answer live at the end. So, Continue to ask those throughout the session. We really want to make sure we answer all of your questions um, and get you um, understanding what it might like to be here on campus. In addition, I do just want to briefly touch on a few things about our student experience in general. So of course, at Syracuse, we have 15,000 undergraduate students and they are coming to us from all 50 states and 163 countries across the globe. So of course, they're bringing their unique passions and interests with them. Um, we have 300 plus uh, student organizations, everything you can think of from performing arts to sports to Greek life, cultural and political organizations, uh, you name it, we probably have something that's up your alley. Um, some of those you're going to hear about tonight, of course. Um, and down in the lower uh, right hand um, photo, I do want to draw your attention there. That's a rendering of what our newly renovated Shine Student Center will look like. Um, it's going to open up this January of 2021. So for those of you who might be first year students next year, um, you'll get kind of first crack at it. But that is where um, expanded space for our LGBT Resource Center will be. Um, so Jorge might touch on that a little bit tonight. But I do also want to mention that we have multiple resource and cultural centers across campus that are designed to serve as students home away from home. So hopefully tonight you'll hear a little bit more um, about what that home might be like when you join us here on campus, and we hope you will. Um, so with that, I want to hand it over to Jorge. Welcome, and thank you for being here with us tonight. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Caitlin. And so once again, my name is Jorge Castillo. I'm the director of the LGBT Resource Center. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I've been at Syracuse University for a little bit over two years, uh, and I'm very, very excited um, to, to share a little bit about our work and what we're doing through our center and then spend um, hopefully some time with, with trying to answer some of your questions. Um, thank you. So very briefly, just I wanna go over some institutional commitments that the university has um, for our queer and trans student population. So things such as the integration of the LGBTQ plus presence in university documents, publications, applications, guidelines, and procedures, right? So if you Google LGBT Syracuse University, there's going to be a sort of an entire array of, of information that is available to you from educational, social, academic information. And we can, again, talk a little bit more about that in, in a few minutes. We've also adapted, um, adopted and adapted um, our chosen name and personal pronoun options in campus informational data systems through um, MySlice and Blackboard. So MySlice is, is the platform that um, our students use that our, actually our faculty, um, staff, and students use, but our, for our students specifically, um, it helps them sort of navigate and, and update their, their, their profiles. Um, and then it also allows them to have that information shared with different areas of the university um, to make sure that 
your chosen name, your personal pronouns are are known and respected. And we're we're still working with sort of the, the IT aspect of it um, as to where it gets shared and how it gets shared. And we want to make sure that your privacy is protected. Um, but it's but again, we sort of rolled that out last October, and and so we're working out kinks. But but it's it's a, uh, received a lot of positive um, feedback from students who started using um, the system. In addition, you're able to um, have your, your student ID sort of reprinted with your chosen name so it reflects your chosen name. It doesn't necessarily have to be your legal name. Um, so for, for some of us that, that have chosen names that are, that are different than our legal names, that's, that's a huge deal. Um, and then again, our LGBTQ plus initiatives on campus are provided through uh, pr predominantly the LGBT Resource Center, which is uh, where, where I work. Um, but it, we also have a lot of campus partners um, that help us through educational, social, and outreach programming. Um, so from academic areas like women's and gender studies, LGBT um, studies minor, communications rhetoric. Um, so for example, just to name a few. And then we have a clear and well-publicized bias response protocol that obviously um, encompasses not just um, issues that touch up on marginalized genders and sexualities, but also just the, the more intersectional aspect of our identities, right? So racism, sexism, um, disability, or, or ableism. Um, thank you. And then we encourage all of our staff to attend an ongoing educational workshops once a year. These workshops are our two hour um, safe zone workshop, which are um, an allyship development workshop. It gives them sort of a crash course on, on like LGBT 101, right? very basic terminology of who we are, who's our community, um, sort of within our country, but also within our university. And then it moves on to sort of like more um, internal bias issues or sort of systemic and, and, and institutional issues that might arise for queer and trans students. And then moving on to sort of like um, allyship development plans, right? Like what is it that you're actually doing to, to be, to advocate for queer and trans students? How can you be a better ally if you call yourself an ally, right? Um, and then ending it with like resources, both at the university, within Syracuse and Central New York, and then national resources that I can also share with you at the very end of our presentation or our time together. Um, and then finally, um, excuse me, um, we provide a visible LGBTQ plus allies within an entire university community. And again, a lot of this comes through programming, events, outreach, um, and workshops. So the overview and purpose of our center, we focus on three general areas to provide community building, um, outreach and visibility, and intellectual and leadership development that centers the experience of people with marginalized sexualities and genders. And we say people because we don't only and exclusively serve our student population, while that is the, the, the predominant audience that, that most of our, our work is geared towards, we also acknowledge that there is sometimes a, a void of, of resources, right? In within Syracuse, within Central New York. And so we also serve as, as a sometimes as a bridge with some of, of the other resources. So some some of our, our more larger events, when we were able to have sort of in-person events and now virtually, um, are often open to community members. So things like some of our LGBTQ History Month, which is starting tomorrow. Um, events are open to the community, our Trans Day of Remembrance, our Trans Week of Liberation in the spring. Um, we have different opportunities to engage with the community. Um, we also started last year, um, yes, last year in the fall, we started a partnership with Sage Upstate and we, we had our first um, intergenerational conversation dinner that we were hoping to continue. And so we're trying to readjust to sort of our new, our new virtual reality and, and find ways to try to continue that, um, that um, initiative. And so I, I have quite a bit of pictures, not, I guess, a lot, but I have some pictures on just to show you some of the programming that we've done. So in terms of community building, for example, we used to be located on Ostrom. Uh, we used to have a house um, and, and we were there for quite a bit um, since the beginning of the center. We've since sort of relocated to Bird Library where we are temporarily, but starting um, next year will be sort of in our permanent home in the renovated Shine Student Center. Um, but on the left, for example, you see, you know, we have crafts nights at, you know, at Ulstrom House. And we try to replicate that when we were in our, our temporary home, which is in Bird Library. So we had a snack and paint party. If you can go back for a second. Um, 
sorry, thank you. So we uh, we actually um, invited a local artist from Syracuse, who's the only person standing up on the picture on the right. And he talked a little bit about his process. He's a, a queer Latinx artist from Syracuse or based out of Syracuse now, who was sort of like talking about his experience and how he processes and how he, he makes art, but also like showing students how to make some art. And so that was sort of a good opportunity to meet other, other queer identified um, folks in that space. And as you can see, there were still boxes we were still moving in. Um, sorry, you, if you can go to the next slide. One before, thank you. Um, additionally, we work very closely with Pride Union, which is our LGBT student organization. I'm their advisor, they are fantastic. Um, and they put together the actually the our country's largest drag show every year. I think they're going on their 15th year, if I'm not mistaken, 15th, 16th year of putting this huge drag show, which is again the largest put together at a university by a student org. And so, for example, the picture on the left, they have they host um, semifinals, and then two weeks later, we invite sort of like big name um, RuPaul, Drag Race. Um, and drag queens to sort of co-host or host um, the event. And so a lot of the times, most of it is Syracuse University, ESF students, but we also have students from Lemoyne College. We have students from, um, from other universities compete as well. And then on the, on the right or, or my right, um, we, we partner a lot with our other cultural centers. So in this case for Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month last year, we invited Joel Kim Booster, who's a comedian, queer, um, queer Korean-American um, comedian to sort of be um, our keynote or, or the keynote speaker for Asian-American Pacific Islander. So the intersections of all of our identities are very important with our programming and with our partnerships. We're very intentional with, with making sure that people don't feel like they have to choose um, one aspect of their identity over another. Um, and if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, in terms of outreach and visibility, again, we're, we're, um, we do a lot of work to try to both educate the campus community, but also be visible um, and ensure and center certain uh, more marginalized members of our community. So every November, we honor Trans Day of Remembrance um, in 2018, so a couple years ago now. We had as a keynote, Ruby Corrado, who opened the first bilingual um, shelter or house for trans women within the metro the dc metro area um all of, of what one of the things that attracted us the most or that the, why we invited ruby to to speak for our trans day remembrance is um part of our advocacy touches up on on immigration on sex work on um hiv stigma and then does so sort of through a very intersectional lens so it's really important for us to bring someone like ruby to speak to our students to talk about the work of organizing of um, in, in this sort of very um, um, important date. And then again, this is sort of the, on the right side, um, we used to be able to put banners outside of Shine. I feel like the, the, in the fall that will look very, it will look very different next year actually, early next year with through the remodel, but we, we often try to do things so that um, folks know that we are a queer and trans friendly campus. So we would put this huge banner. I don't think you can tell um, the scale based on, on that picture, but there's an area, um, the grassy knoll, for example, if you Google it, um, Thursday, which is you know, the beginning of LGBTQ History Month, we're gonna put um, the pride, the Philly pride flags, like a lot of little flags all up the, the, um, the grass, the grassy area. Um, and we do other partnerships with like TransUnion, Color Collective, which is a cutie puck student org, um, to chalk the chalk the quad, right? Put information about queer and trans individuals. Um, if you can go to, thank you. One more, yeah. So continuing our, our outreach and visibility, again, through our partnerships for Trans Week of Liberation, um, March 29th, we nationally, we celebrate um, Trans Day of Disability and Trans Day of Disability is supposed to be sort of the other side of the coin for Trans Day of Remembrance, which honors uh, trans individuals, trans people who have been um, murdered um, because of their trans identity, right? And more often than not, they, they tend to be trans black women, uh, trans women of color. And so trans, trans Week of Liberation is sort of our expanded um, trans day of visibility. So we wanted to expand it from one day to an entire week of events. And we have a keynote, we have some educational component. So this past spring, for example, we had 
um, a, a trans activist educator give an entire sort of allyship, a trans specific allyship workshop. Um, and then in 2019, we had um, activist and model Gina Rosero in partnership again with our Office of Multicultural Affairs um, as part of, of Asian American Pacific Islander Pacific Islander Heritage Month um, deliver our keynote, right? Which was great because it brings different students of different backgrounds and experiences into this one room to, to sort of share um, with the one keynote. Um, and then on the right side, that's our logo for our safe zone. So safe zone is our, our, our allyship, our general intro allyship um, workshop that we provide. Um, that is sort of like the entry level for two hours of, of essentially like what, what do you know and not know and what do you need to unlearn? And then we have more specialized that follow, right? So then after that, we do a trans specific. We can do a healthcare disparity information, right? We can do a, um, excuse me, a inclusivity within, you know, within a classroom, for example. Um, thank you. We can go to the next one. Next slide. Um, and then the third aspect of, of what we do through our center is, um, excuse me, is the intellectual and leadership development aspect of our mission, right? And so on the left, there's a picture from Creating Change Leadership Conference. Every year we take a delegation of students, queer trans students, to this national conference that usually, that hosts around, um, tw um, excuse me, 30,000 um, members or LGBT folk and allies from all over the country, right? Um, and it's a social justice um, conference that takes place in different locations throughout um, every, every year. This next year, it was going to be um, hosted in Washington, DC, um, but because of, of the pandemic and, and all the, the travel restrictions, it's gonna be a virtual conference. But every year we take a, a delegation and prior to going to the conference, we do some workshops, we do some work with the students. So they try to get the best out of their experience. And then afterwards, we do sort of a debrief and try to apply some of, you know, the quote unquote, create the change when we, we come back to campus, right? Um, so this was our delegation a couple of years ago when we went to Detroit, I believe. Um, and then on the far right, um, we also, again, organize um, a lot of collaborations. So for example, our Queer, Queer in the Archives, it was a Cutie Pock Media Symposium. Um, in the morning, we had different sessions on um, new media creators, right? So YouTubers, podcasters, um, different, different artists and activists, right? And then in this picture, what you're seeing is sort of a live recording of Queer Walk. Um, so so the women from Queer Walk, they spoke a little bit about the process and we talked about how do they create a, a podcast, for example. And then in the, in the afternoon section of the symposium, we did a live recording of their episode. And so, um, yeah, so that's, that's what that picture is about. And then our next slide shows um, some of the other work that um, we've done with Pride Union, for example. So we had a race and racism in RuPaul's Drag Race conversation. Um, we invited on the, I don't know if you're familiar with RuPaul's Drag Race, I wasn't too familiar with it. And so I learned a lot about it from, from our students and from our, our Pride Union and Color Collective group. Um, but we invited the Vixen to have this conversation, right, about sort of some of the, the issues already within like this very mainstream popular show that, that sort of glamorizes both drag culture, right, now it's mainstream, but, but someone like the Vixen who experienced quite a bit of racism through sort of the production or the pre-production stuff um, and shared some of those experiences and, and to, to try to demystify a little bit of, of what you see in the mainstream sort of pop culture, right, and talking a little bit about sort of inherent racism within LGBT community, which a lot of us are familiar with. And then on the right side, October 21st, um, it's International Pronoun Day. And so we often do mostly educational outreach um, as a way to uh, promote uh, proper usage. You know, the what, the how, the why. It's important to respect people's pronouns, right? Not just trans people, not just non-binary people use pronouns. We all use pronouns, cisgender people use pronouns. Um, so it's important to sort of do a lot of educational outreach on this day. Um, this year, we'll be doing some trainings, so sort of like drop-in virtual trainings for folks to do. Um, and then some of our university resources. Um, you know, of course, our LGBT Resource Center. We are one of three cultural centers, along with the Office of Multicultural Affairs and the Disability Cultural Center. And then sort of like our sister cousin, um, Cultural Center is the Center for International Studies. Um, 
academically, we have an LGBT studies minor. Um, the Barn Center at the Arch um, has a gender affirming group therapy. These are three examples of different groups that they've hosted in the past. Usually those groups are based upon interest, need, um, availability of therapists. And so for example, they've had in the past a spectrum minded exploring gender and sexual identity and LGBTQIA plus identity exploration for folks that are trying, that are either gender fluid or they're trying to figure out sort of their, their sexual gender identities. Um, and then full ourselves for folks who, who uh, are sort of going through the process, right? Or, or processing, identifying as members of our community. And then we also have the gender expansive support team through the couple and family therapy center at the fall, um, at fall college. Um, and again, that is sort of a, a separate resource for students, right? That provides therapy, predominantly therapy, right? Um, and then finally, we have the, the pronoun gender preferred name advisory council, which is sort of the, the group that I co-chair and we were tasked with um, ensuring sort of the technical aspects of, of making sure that your chosen name, that your, that your personal pronouns, that, you, that there was a, a system that would allow you to notify the university of your chosen name, of your personal pronouns, right? And that that information was, was pushed to, to the people that needed to have that information, right? Um, and that's one of, one of the, the aspects of it. They're also doing some more um, human resource compliance trainings through for faculty and staff so that our, our um, faculty and staff are able to serve or better serve our queer and trans students. Um, and then looking at just some student organizations, again, I mentioned Pride Union and Color Collective quite a bit. Pride Union is the largest LGBTQ um, student org, undergraduate student org, and Color Collective is sort of a, a smaller cutie pock queer trans student of color specific group. Um, they oftentimes they partner, oftentimes they collaborate. Um, and then we have Open Doors, which is a graduate student LGBT group. Last year, we started OSTEM, which is for students, queer and trans students who are in the STEM field. And again, I'm, I'm sort of the, I'm actually the advisor for all of the undergraduate student orgs. But one of the cool things about OSTEM is that we're refocusing it for uh, more of a professional development organization. So we'll be doing um, workshops on how to interview via Zoom, because right now this is sort of our new reality. And so we're, we're trying to figure out and make sure that our, our students have the best tools or they have the, the, the preparation, right, um, to go into these fields. But we're also planning a, a panel discussion conversation with queer trans people who are already in the field, right? And so they've discussing how they negotiate being queer or being out, right, within, with, within sort of very cis, hetero, um, career paths, if you will. And then the out crowd is our, our student magazine that publishes once a semester. Um, it is being um, advised actually at their new house. So again, it is an all LGBT um, run and produced magazine. Um, and then law school has Outlaw, ESF, um, the SUNY ESF campus has the Sexuality and Gender Alliance, Osaga, and then Upstate Medical <clears throat> has Spectrum. And then around central New York, there's also a lot of resources, right? So if there's something that for some reason we don't have through this Syracuse University, um, we'll be able to try to connect you through some of our, our, our sort of like regional resources. And they include ACR Health, which provides a lot of sexual health and information, including HIV, STI testing, and PrEP or access to PrEP, um, as well as um, contraception, et cetera and then CNY HIV Care Network or CNY Pride, who are the, is the group that organizes our Pride Festival in June. Um, they're also trying to expand to become more of a community resource um, for a wider, or th that does wider events than just Pride during June. And so for example, throughout the pandemic, they've been hosting fantastic um, webinars and, and, and workshops on mental health, right? The importance of mental health and seeking counseling, for example. Um, and then in addition, for example, and I don't want to actually touch up on all of them, but like Friends of Dorothy, they host monthly dinners at the, that, um, which is a great way to sort of have internet intergenerational um, conversations. And then moving on to, for example, Sage Upstate, which is the, the second on the right. Um, they, they predominantly serve um, an older population of LGBTQ folks. Um, and so we're trying to sort of bridge some of these gaps. The Q Center, which is right above Sage, 
um, they are sort of an, um, an offshoot or, or sort of part of ACR Health, but they focus more on support for um, 13 through 17 year old um, LGBTQ identified individuals. Um, and then just, of course, Planned Parenthood and Vera House are two additional amazing resources that we have in the region. And then national resources, you might recognize some of these, such as Human Rights Campaign, the Trevor Project, um, which provides you know, a national 24-hour toll-free um, suicide hotline um, and crisis hotline, as well as the National Center for Trans Equality. Those are all great resources um, in terms of education for allies, but also for our LGBT um, community. GLSEN um, provides a lot of tools for K through 12 predominantly, but this is information that um, it's helpful for our students, it's helpful for our educators as well, our faculty members. And then Fenway Institute, um, we work with them closely to try to develop um, information and workshops around healthcare disparity and to try to make sure that our, our healthcare providers on campus are trained um, to the best of their abilities to, to, to be inclusive to our queer and trans student population. And some virtual student engagement at the center. I'm not sure how updated this is actually. Um, so again, we host virtual office hours currently by appointment on Zoom. We also take um, appointments in person at the center currently. However, they have to be by appointment, unfortunately. Um, so virtual office hours sort of serves a, a wider opportunity for folks to engage with us or to talk to us. Um, Mondays, we do Instagram check-ins. Um, and we, you know, right now I think we're trying to curate a playlist for our Spotify because some of our students were asking if we could do like a group Spotify playlist. And so I believe last week um, a graduate assistant is the one who runs our Instagram um, account was asking that. And so we're trying to like work with that. So a lot of it is, is trying to see what students are needing in this moment so that we, we can program or try to um, provide those resources. Um, and then we have affinity groups for um, sort of like a general LGBTQ group. We have a cutie pop specific, we have a trans non-binary, and we have an ACE group. We've also started doing affinity groups through Zoom for trans non-binary students. Um, we're doing virtual safe zones workshops and LGBTQ 101s. And then of course, tomorrow we, we sort of kick off um, LGBTQ History Month. Um, and we're doing sort of a sort of a soft passive opening. Uh, to maintain social distance, to ensure that people are, are, are safe and feeling safe, instead of organizing a, a bigger um, opening celebration, um, we'll be raising the, the new pride flag over San um, Hendricks Chapel. And so we'll be recording that um, through our Instagram live and be sharing that along with a link to our, um, sort of like our calendar for the month. Um, and actually, if I can share my screen, I can share with you. Oh, thank you, Kaylin. Um, all right, so this is our website and let me show you, actually, let me see if I, if I toggle. I've been doing Zoom for six months and I still struggle sometimes. Um, so all of our information in terms of our programs, our trainings, our virtual office hours is available through our link um, Linktree account, right? So linktr.ee forward slash S-U-L-G-B-T-R-C. And then there you can find all of the links to our website, our Instagram, our Facebook, um, some of our programs. So for example, we're doing, we're painting pumpkins in a couple weeks, two weeks. Um, so gor um, gorgeous gaze, pumpkin painting. Um, we have a trans affinity group that's specific. We're doing a scavenger hunt. So all of our events, all of our programs, you can RSVP here. Um, and I also wanted to show you um, some of our LGBTQ History Month, um, which actually, let me see if I can find it because I thought I had it open. Um, give me one quick second. Um, so our keynote um, is next Thursday. Um, our keynote is next Thursday, and actually I'm not sharing my screen, so my apologies for that. Um, 
again, Zoom never gets old, so surprising. So this is our calendar. Um, this year we're doing something a little bit different in terms um, within our division of enrollment and student experience. We we sort of have a shared theme, which is all in. Um, and then within each celebratory month, we've, um, we've come up with different themes, right? Um, so for us, this, this month, um, our theme is celebrating and uplifting Black queer, um, black queer voices and Black queerness. Um, and so some of our, our events, are, for example, is our second annual Potash LGBTQ History Month keynote, um, an alumni, Dr. Seth Davis, um, will be virtually um, given a lecture called Shade and Trade, Black Queer Literacies of Survival. Um, we are doing a, a virtual tour of Harlem. It's called Historic Homo Harlem Tour. And so we'll look at some artists and activists um, within sort of the, the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and that's provided by um, Christopher Street Tours. Last year, we were able to take a, a group of students in New York City for a weekend and do a tour of the city in person and do all kinds of activities. And so we're, we've sort of adjusted to, to our current um, limitations. Um, we're also hosting a book club um, and we're reading Black Girl Dangerous on Race, Queerness, Class, and Gender by Mia McKenzie. And our discussion is being uh, facilitated by a professor of women's and gender studies and by a local activist and organizer and co-founder of Black Youth Pride. Um, so we're trying to sort of bridge both the academic side along with the activist side and with the city of Syracuse. Um, or for example, next Friday from 10 to midnight, and I think the time has shifted, uh, we'll be hosting a drag queen bingo in the quad. Um, and that is in partnership with um, um, Orange After Dark, so student activities. Um, and then we have a surprise guest from RuPaul's Drag Race that is gonna be virtually hosting it or co-hosting with one of our local drag queens that will be here in person at the quad. So, so we're trying to be creative with the ways that we're trying to engage. And then as part of Latinx Heritage um, Month, Latinx Hispanic Heritage Month, um, we've also partnered with the Office of Multicultural Affairs um, to host uh, Louis A. Ortiz Fonseca, who has an amazing project called Gran Barones, and he'll be giving a talk and a workshop called Our Bones Glow in the Dark, The Power of Storytelling in the Digital Space. Um, so there, there's a lot of opportunities for students to engage both in academic and social and advocacy work. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen and then I'll open it up to questions if you have yeah. any questions. Thank you, Jorge. It sounds like you're going to have an extremely busy month <laughs> coming up. Um, Too busy, yes. Yes. Um, so while you were speaking, we did have several questions come in, so I'm happy to facilitate those for you. So the first one is from Christina, and she, or I'm sorry, I don't want to um, assume a pronoun, but Christina is asking, would you be able to talk about studying abroad while being LGBT? Excellent. Excellent question. Actually, next Monday, we're doing a top five places to study abroad. Um, originally, our, our our program is in partnership with, with Study Abroad. Um, we're very cognizant of, of pink washing when, when, when students go abroad, right? It is very easy to sort of romanticize and say, oh, Western Europe, you're perfectly fine. You'll be safe, right? And so we wanted to mystify that. Obviously, it, it might seem more welcoming to study in Western Europe um, if you are cisgender, if you're white, if you're upper middle class, right? And so we want to make sure that students, that queer and trans students who are going abroad are able to do so in, in a more prepared way, right? So last year we were hosting dinners with the Study Abroad program where we would talk about, okay, so if you're going to, let's say Cuba, for example, to study abroad, you might not find a Planned Parenthood or you might not find a gay bar, right? But there are other ways that you can find community, right? That you can find a social life or that you can find healthcare or that you can find um, affirming doctors, for example. Um, and so like it's, it's helping students have the, the education so that when they make their choices of where they go, um, they don't feel sort of like fish out of water, right? That they, they're prepared, they know what they're getting themselves into, but that they can navigate their queerness in a way that is safe, in a way that allows them to have a full experience, right? Without sort of like recloseting themselves if they're out. Um, that's a great question, Christine. Excellent, thank you. Um, next question I'm seeing from Cassidy is, would you say there are a lot of resources for allies to get more education on the LGBTQ plus community? Yes, so we offer our, our general safe zone once a month. Those are open, you know, we, we do RSVP, but they're monthly um, offerings. We are doing more and more of our trans specific ones, but then we also um, 
me as a sort of like co-chair of different committees, right? I'm always sort of offering to different departments, to different chairs, to different relationships that we have on campus. And so they've invited us to different staff meetings, to different faculty meetings, right? Where we provide that additional information that is needed. We also visit some of our, our first year student courses, so sort of our, our intro courses, um, to give sort of like a crash course on LGBT. So we're always like trying to both um, do outreach, right? So we want to uh, let folks know that, that we're there as a resource to help them educate so that they don't rely on their queer and trans students for that education. So yes, there, there is quite a bit of, um, we're, we're working on our website. It's still a little bit, um, it needs a, lot, a little bit of, a lot of work, a lot of love, but we're trying to also use that as a repository for information so that if we can schedule a training or a workshop that our faculty and staff and our allies can go there and find answers. Definitely. Okay, next question. Um, Sonia is wondering, can you tell us more about OSTEM? OSTEM. So OSTEM was started by two of my amazing student assistants um, who are in, in STEM and they are, it's actually a national organization. Um, they host an annual conference every November this year. Of course, it's going to be virtual. Um, but again, we work closely with the departments and the colleges that are STEM specific. And we've expanded a little bit of what STEM means, right? So we're not very specifically with just like sticking to like the engineering and the hard sciences, right? Whatever that means. Um, and so we're, we're sort of like allowing for some grace for students who are, are interested in, in sort of the quote unquote softer sciences um, to also be engaged. Because at, at the end of it, what we're trying to do is create a space for queer trans students who are in fields where statistically there are not a lot of people who are out, right? Or, or there are more people who are from marginalized identities, right? Um, and so we work very, very closely with some of these departments and chairs. Um, Excellent. Thank you. Next question I'm seeing, does your campus have a clear procedure for reporting LGBTQ plus related bias incidents and hate crimes? We do. We have the stop bias um, process and it's not necessarily LGBTQ specific, but it's, it's, a, it's a much more general um, bias incident reporting tool. Um, but through this tool, um, you're able to, of course, like specify the form of, of hate speech, of hate crime, of incident, right? Um, and this is run through um, the Dean of Students and we're able to, they're able to put in contact with like the best um, resources, right? And so if it is an LGBTQ specific, then some of their counselors, some of their case managers, they'll contact us. We'll make sure that we're providing sort of the, the, the back end educational opportunity that is needed for whether it's a faculty staff or another student member, right? In addition to, to the process that happens with the student code of conduct, right? So, which is, is handled separately, but we, we're there to provide the information, the educational aspect of it. Great. Okay, next question is coming in from Troy. In terms of on-campus housing, what kinds of resources do you offer for trans or LGBTQ students in general? In general? Oh, Jorge, I think you're- I muted myself, I'm sorry. <laughs> My mouse is very touchy. Um, in general, we have a living and learning community, which is an LGBTQ learning community. It's, um, and they are actually in Del Plain. And so they, they occupy a good section of, of the floor, the, a certain floor. Um, and they have, a, again, a specific RA that works ex exclusively with them and with us at the LGBT Resource Center. And so we, we partner with programming. Um, and so it's a gender, inclusive housing where when, when you go through the application process of the living and learning community, you're able to sort of select um, the folks that you're comfortable living with that you would like to live with. Um, and so that's, that's one of the opportunities. Um, however, there are other aspects of, of gender inclusive housing that you can explore um, if you reach out to OSL, the Office of Student Living. Awesome. Okay, another question coming in from Christina. Would you say that most students feel comfortable when out at Syracuse? What is the outlook um, on the LGBT community in Syracuse? Uh, that's, that's a tough question. Um, and I wish there were more like student staff and, and students that could speak to their own experiences. because I feel like me as, as a staff, as a pro staff, um, I might have a very different experience. But generally speaking, um, because the university does so much to make sure that there, that there is both visibility, that there is representation, that there is um, faculty and staff who are out as queer as trans, right? Um, because the academic side of the aspect 
is very well represented because through our center, we do a lot of um, social educational advocacy work. Um, there is um, opportunity for students who are comfortable to be out and open. Um, however, I'm not, I, 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 I would be remiss to say that, that it's perfect, right? That there's always going to be issues and, and situations where, and not just with LGBT individuals, right? Where, where certain people are not going to feel comfortable or be comfortable, right? Um, Syracuse is, is a relatively um, small city in comparison to other places where I've lived. Um, and so it's all relative in that sense, um, but there is quite a bit of, of resources. If, if you recall from, from the central New York area, there's a lot of, of, of opportunities and resources, right? There's um, LGBTQ owned businesses that, that you can access, restaurants, bars. Um, and so there, there is sort of a larger community outside of the university, right? So it's not just programming through our center. There are things that are happening throughout campus and throughout the city that, that make it more welcoming, right? And then again, through New York State, we do have, you know, protections at the state level, which, which again, provides um, some more support for folks to, to be out and open. Awesome. And Jorge, if a student, um, you know, who's on this session or another student wanted to connect with a current student, you know, who's active in your office, is that something um, they could email you about, perhaps? They could. They could. And, and then again, I would, they had a very specific question. So I know, um, Christina, you asked about and I don't know if it was Christina, so I apologize. No, someone else asked about housing. So there's something like a very specific housing question, then I, I most definitely could put you in contact with some students who live in the living and learning community. Or whoever asked about OSTEM, again, two of our, our president and vice president of OSTEM are actually our, our student assistants. So I would be very happy to put you in contact with them if you have specific questions about, about the organization and, and what they're planning, yeah. Awesome. Um, we'll put your contact information up again before we conclude. So um, next question I'm seeing, and this one might be a tough one too, what percentage of students are a part of the LGBTQ community? So unfortunately, um, that's not information that we collect institutionally. And, and I've been, um, and I, I kind of started conversations to find ways that we can collect some, some of that information in a way that is, um, is relevant, is useful, but it's also protects student privacy. We don't, we don't know. Unfortunately, we don't. There, there, that's, that's not information that is asked. We don't ask if a student identifies as LGBT or is queer or trans. Um, and so we're trying to find ways because that would probably help us also make sure that we get the resources to students who might need them, right? Who might not be out or who might not, for example, need to live in or want to live in the live in and learn community, but they still are going to need access to information, right? Or to healthcare that is inclusive. So. Right. Yeah, I, I couldn't really tell you. I couldn't even ballpark it. Um, yeah. um, kind of a related question. There's a, there was another question asked about, um, you know, when a student applies to Syracuse on the common application and enters um, their gender identity, if they want to change that later when they get to campus or, you know, further down the road, how does that work? So gender identity would be connected through it's legal information, right? So it's legal protected information, unfortunately. And so it would almost be like a legal name change where there would need to be sort of, there is a legal process. Um, but again, I'm happy to sort of talk to, to you or to, to that person more specifically offline as to different ways or different organizations that can help facilitate that. Um, again, the beauty of, of, of SU is that you might not, you don't have to change your, le your name legally, for example, to make sure that your chosen name is shared and respected and seen, right? And that even your, your SUID card reflects that. Um, but for other things, there are sort of legal limitations, right? So for transcripts, diplomas, et cetera, um, insurance cards, right? That would be tied to your legal name. And, and so your gender identity as well as, your, or, or your sex assigned at birth, which unfortunately is conflated oftentimes, um, is connected, right? To, to this um, legal document, right? And so, so that would be sort of like a case by case that could be figured out, but there's there's a team of us that can help you figure that awesome. out. Awesome. Okay, looks like we have two more questions. So for anyone who hasn't had a chance to get their question answered, there's still time to chat those in. Um, but another question from Brian, how is the party scene is at, um, at Syracuse is at LGBTQ friendly? Well, considering that I am significantly older, I, I, <laughs> I'm not sure what an undergrad LGBT party scene would be. Um, 
yeah, I, I don't, but I, I can give you sort of like our LGBTQ resource center um, party scene, right? So we, again, I just, I got lucky that I have an amazing student staff team. Um, so two of our student staff members are DJs. So as we were getting ready to, for students to move in into the fall, both of them, they organized um, an Instagram live DJing party on a Friday night, which surprisingly was very well attended. Um, not surprisingly because they are amazing, but like for a Friday night on Instagram live for two student DJs that were DJing from their house, their living room. Um, and we had quite a bit, we had like 30, 40 students or people participate. I'm not sure they were all students, but, and so, so there is sort of community and that's one of the biggest sort of like our overarching theme for everything that we do through our resource center is community, right? We, we want to create the community for you to find your people, to be comfortable with your people, whatever that means, whatever your people means, right? Um, and so creating those opportunities. So for example, this coming weekend, we're taking a group of students, apple picking, right? And that, that's a good way to make friendships, right? And so I don't know about the party culture, but you'll make friends, right? Uh, we, we've been hosting game nights, um, virtual game nights, um, Jackbox gaming system. I, mm -hmm. Our graduate assistant runs them. And so again, they're fairly well attended. We usually get like 15, 20 students that are showing up and they're connecting, they meet here in, in those programs that we set up, but they continue their conversations outside of that. Pride Union has a very active group me account, which I've had to sort of silence and mute because they're they're like, again, which they're, I'm very proud of them because they're maintaining social distance, they're wearing masks, but they're like, oh, let's meet for tea here and only five of us can go. And so like, so there, there are ways that you can meet um, folks. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, another question. Can you talk about the LGBTQ studies minor? Yes, I can. Um, and actually, they're a little bit in transition. Their, their brilliant director um, actually just retired this over the summer. And so they'll be in transition, but, and I don't have the specifics, unfortunately, um, but they are, it's, it's run to the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, it's a very intersectional um, program. And I don't have the specifics, and I apologize. Um, at this time for how many credits are required. Um, but I can share if, if you send me a, an email and I know it's an anonymous attendee, um, I can provide you that if, via email. So if you, if, if you just email me, I can send you the yep. information as yep. well. We'll post your email up in a second. And um, Tammy or Mike, behind the scenes, if you wanna share the link to that um, program with the student, that'd be great too, or in the chat rather. Thank um, you. Okay, it looks like our last question. Um, if a student comes out and has non-supporting parents who decide not to help them pay for college, is there support or resources um, to help students get through that? Yes, the, the short answer is yes. We, we go out of our way to make sure that um, all of our students are safe, right? That they, that they have a place to, to live, that they have um, access to food, that they have access to healthcare, that they have access to their education. Um, and so, however the, the, the student or the person is, is comfortable, they can either reach out to us through the center and we can sort of be the ones to be in conversation with the Dean of Students. So this is more of a Dean of Student um, area where they, they provide sort of like the, the more financial support, right? That's one of the aspects. And in close, usually they, they'll have a case manager that will work with the student um, to again, to ensure that their safety is top priority, right? That they have help, that have housing, food, healthcare, all that stuff. Um, also, Hendrix Chapel has a fantastic um, grant process for students who are, you know, financially struggling from, from time to time, um, you know, so either to help them pay, pay the semester to be able to get through the semester as they figure out, like, what would happen next if, if they have unsupportive um, parents or family, um, as well as books or issues with books, right? Um, and then the case managers through the Dean of Students would help them more sort of like institutionally, what can be done, right? Like, are there grants that we can look for? Are there things that we can tweak on financial aid so that you have access to the resources, to the money, right? To, to cover your tuition, to cover your books, to cover your healthcare, your, your living expenses. So yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, but again, it's, it's case by case, depending on where the student is, what they need. Um, is it in the middle of the semester? Has the semester started? So there's all these variables, but yes, there there is sort of a network of us that ensure that our students are not sort of like left um, out there to hang, hang, hang out in there. Yeah. <laughs> hang yes, definitely. Um, okay, great. Thank you for sharing that. So important. 
Um, so I think that's the end of our questions. I did want to mention, so in the chat, um, Mike did share the link to the LGBT studies minor. So if anyone's interested in that, you can click there and look at all of the required courses and, and information regarding that. Um, so Jorge, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for being with us this evening. Um, of course, your information is here on the screen, also on the chat. Um, and if, if anyone uh, misses it for some reason, you're welcome to email us at orange at syr.edu or give us a call at the admissions office and we'd be happy to con uh, connect you with Jorge or his team um, in the LGBT Resource Center. Jorge, any last words of wisdom or anything you'd like to share before we close tonight? No, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, I'm happy to, to share more information if you have any questions. I think um, like, like anything, it is, it is not a perfect system, right? But, but we are actively engaging in ways to make it better and more inclusive for our queer and trans students. So thank you for, for joining us today. Yes, thank you so much. And for all of you um, in the audience, thanks again for, for being with us tonight. Of course, we hope you'll tune in for our future student experience sessions, including one of the sessions about Hendricks Chapel, with Jorge, which Jorge uh, just mentioned. So thanks again and have a great night. Stay safe.